In the third equation, we're going to balance the mass of the fluid. And we're going to count, so we're going to write the mass balance for the fluid accounting for these things. So, you know, we know from, you know, earlier in the class we have like d rho dt plus rho grad p, right, equals zero. That's our kind of our standard mass balance, right? But here, because we have this fluid solid mixture, we need to, and, and we want to account for the balance of mass of the entire, of the fluid, taking into account the fact that the solid structure can deform. So in order to do that, we have to sort of add in some other terms. And so what those terms are is we're going to consider the increase <coughs> in volume due to volumetric strain. So that's going to be a term like that, the rate of increase in volume due to volumetric strain. We're going to consider the additional volume stored by compression of the fluid. due to fluid pressure increase. And so that's going to be a term that is related to the porosity, the change in pressure, uh, divided by the compressibility or the, the bulk the bulk modulus of the fluid. We're also going to consider the additional volume stored by compression of the solid. And that's going to be 1 minus n dp dt over 1 over the bulk modulus of the solid. This will be for an isotropic material. And then finally, we're going to consider the change in volume of the solid due to fluid pressure. And so if you remember last time when we derived, like, we had this kind of picture that we used for the derivation of BO's coefficient. Where we have this internal pressure in the pores. And if that increases, it, cr it increases some, you know, for a, a little element in the solid, you're going to have an additional hydrostatic stress associated with that. <laughs> and so what that term looks like, uh, it can be derived from the kind of concept of effective stress. It's something like one, the,
So the KT, if you remember from when we talked about BO coefficient, that's the total bulk modulus that you would measure in when you have a saturated porous material. Okay, so if we if we balance these with the divergence of I wrote it up here V, but we want to talk about W, the, the fluid with respect to the solid. So if we balance those additional terms we wrote with, res with the divergence of W and include the time dependent pressure term and everything else, we get an equation that looks like this. So there's the di divergence of W plus So the first and the last term are just our original momentum balance equation, right? We're just written a little bit differently. The first and the last term are just the original momentum balance equation. Say if you just had it, you know, if the porosity was one, right? If it was completely fluid, you'd have that. And then you have the other terms. Can everybody read all the terms? Yeah. P. Oh, I see. Okay. If the only ones that are row have an F next to them, right? Every, I'm, you know, I apologize for my handwriting. I, when I write a row, I try to put a little hook on the end of it. But this is this is row F. And if we use the definition of alpha, remember we had that alpha is 1 minus kT over kS. We derived this last time. Then we can actually write this uh, equation a little bit more compactly. I'm also going to use a dot to represent the time derivative. Q is just a constant, or it's easier to write 1 over Q. So this is our third equation. So now we have three equations and three unknowns. And we, writ we wrote the equations um, such that we used V. But keep in mind, V 
is u dot, right? So everywhere we wrote a v dot, we could also write, have written u double dot. So u is the displacement of the solid, v is the velocity of the solid, right? So with that, if we, if we perform that substitution, then our three unknowns become pressure, the velocity of the fluid, so I'll just write pressure of the fluid, velocity of the fluid, and the displacement of the solid. So those are the most general form of the equations. Of course, we are assuming small displacements here. So you notice I used the small strain. Okay. Uh, if you did have finite rotations or large deformations, then these would not equations wouldn't be approximation, like we've learned, seen many times. Okay. So you know. Remember that V and W are vectors, right? So that's actually, you know, if we were to code this up in finite element code in three dimensions, right, we'd have to solve for three displacement components, three velocity components, and pressure. So, you know, basically every, if, if you're talking about finite elements, right, every computational node would have seven degrees of freedom. So, you know, even one hexahedron have 28 unknowns. And if you stall these quasi-statically where you need to build a stiffness matrix, it doesn't take too many elements to get a very, very big matrix, right? Or, you know, tangent matrix. I don't know if you guys are familiar with solution techniques. We'll talk about that later in the, in the class. I know Hissa now is, right? He's, so, uh, so anyway, you know, it'd be nice if we could, through some approximation, reduce this set of equations in some way. And it turns out we can. If you remember, 